Good afternoon, everyone. On today's edition of The Final Bar, we'll wrap the week like we do every Friday, taking today's price action, understanding it, but then putting it into the proper long-term context. We're going to have a new segment called Pro Tip, where we'll talk about a new feature on stock charts called the Chart List Reports. Really fantastic feature. A lot of people have been enjoying it. Can't wait to share it with you. We'll also open up The Final Bar Mailbag. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host every weekday, 4 o'clock Eastern on the show. My name is Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rare sunny Friday here in Redmond, Washington. Really appreciate you joining us today and every day. Please keep your questions and your feedback coming. We've been getting a lot of great feedback from our viewers and a lot of really interesting questions. Uh, we're going to unpack a couple of those in our mailbag segment today, but keep them coming anytime. The final bar at stockcharts.com is the way to get a hold of us. Also on Twitter at final bar SCTV. Um, interesting week. If you like volatility, hopefully you've had plenty to think about with today's ups or with this week's ups and downs. Uh, you know, the, the week started with a little bit of uh, rupturing, a little bit of selling off, and then all of a sudden we have a reaccumulation, and almost, you know, just like that, we're back at the, at the previous high. So, a lot of interesting long term themes to unpack. We're going to look at today's price action connected to this week's activity as part of our Wrap the Week segment, and then look at the long term trends, try to get a good sense of where we've been, and think about the next couple weeks going into year end. It's going to be really, I think, critical for uh, a lot of investors in terms of understanding where uh, next year might, uh, might lead to. In one of our segments uh, today, we're going to talk about a pro tip. There's a new feature on stock charts. Really excited to share with you the chart list reports. I'll show you what they are and how to, uh, how to incorporate them into your process using the product. Also, we'll open up the final, final bar mailbag, answer some really good questions about highs and lows, how to understand them. I'll talk to you about the zigzag indicator and also talk to you a little bit about AI and what it means to you as an investor. All of those coming from questions from all of you. So let's get right to the charts, folks. Um, this week uh, and today has been fascinating. And, uh, and again, if you like charts, if you are a chart watcher, a chart consumer, plenty of interesting things to see. There have been times over recent years where it's been a little bit boring. Trends have just sort of evolved and they're just sort of slow and steady. It has not been the case this week. So this is the last five days of trading. After last week, which was pretty consistent, higher highs, higher lows, sort of moving higher, a lot of accumulation, most days ending uh, with the close above the open, that completely changed this week, right? And so we have Monday's big distribution after Friday holding up okay. Monday sell off, the big gap down for Tuesday, then Wednesday, Thursday rallying a little bit, and then we have the jump uh, higher. And again, plenty of news flow causing a lot of these patterns on the charts. As a reminder, charts are not independent of the news flow. Tweets and news headlines and all of that, U.S.-China trade negotiations and discussions are what caused a lot of the gaps Earlier in the week today, it's a jobs report pushing stocks higher very quickly. But again, overall, the charts are really important to watch because that's how you visually understand how people are reacting to that news flow. So just because there are big news headlines does not mean at any time that you want to stop looking at charts. I would argue that is the best time to be looking at charts. So where are we at? On a closing basis, we have not eclipsed the high from last week. That's really the all-time high there on the S&P 500. We did not get there, but boy, we certainly seem to be moving in that direction with nice accumulation today, a close above the open, uh, and that's following through from a couple uh, higher closes during the week. So overall in pretty good shape. Let's look at the short-term price action today. We've talked a lot about the last 30 minutes and getting a little bit of a window into what people are seeing going into uh, into the end of the day, and in this case, the end of the week. Look at this rounding sort of pattern we have today. So the big gap up based on the overnight uh, news, the jobs number that came out pretty well this morning. We had a nice rally in the first uh, two hours of trading, which is pretty pretty solid. And then since then, sort of a slow and steady rollover. Rallied a little bit in the last hour, but closed back toward the lows. And that you know distribution into the close, maybe a little bit of a, of a preview of what we might see next week. We'll have to see uh, how the patterns play out. But overall, you know, in, in general, a nice uh, finish to the week after a sell-off. There's no denying that this in, you know, broadly speaking, more positive than negative, uh, which is uh, which is pretty, pretty encouraging, I would say, overall. 
Looking at our member dashboard page, and again, if you look at one page on stock charts, this is where I would start. This is a great way to just get an overview of what's happening. Your charts and your, your page might look different than mine. At any point, click on the gears on your own login. You can, you can tweak it to look similar to what I did. The S&P 500 up 91 basis points today at, at the time I took the, uh, the shot here. So almost 1%. The Dow Industrial is up a little bit further. The NASDAQ up a little bit, uh, little bit more as well. Let's look at small versus mid versus large cap. That's one of the themes that we've talked about. Mega caps, the S&P 100, the 100 biggest companies essentially up 1%. Mid caps up a little less, 0.95%. Small caps, the big winner today, up 1.4%. That's one of the big themes that we've been looking at on the show over months is this idea of small cap versus large cap and whether there's a resilience, a, a move to more of risk on bet for in the form of small caps. Today, we certainly saw that with small caps up more than anything else. Let's look at the sector returns today. Uh, energy up the most, up almost 2%. So always interesting to see what leads the, uh, the market higher on a big update like this. It was energy, it was financials, it was industrials. Those are the three top sectors. At the bottom of the list, we have utilities and real estate and then staples. So that is by any stretch of the imagination, a move away from defensive sectors and away into more offensive sectors. This is a vote of confidence for market strength leading into, uh, into the new year. And again, that's based just on today's trading. Let's connect it to some of the long-term uh, trends as much as possible. So the chart of the XLF is one we've looked at uh, a number of times on the show. I'm going to bump this out to a two-year chart of the XLF. You know, this is one, uh, you know, real interesting long-term base that we're seeing. So a uh, low surrounded by a series of higher lows, sort of this complex basing pattern. The resistance around 29.50 is one that we broke above last month. We then retested it. And as of today, have now broke to new closing and new intraday highs. So a real resolution to the upside, a vote of confidence for the markets in general with the XLF leading higher and, and really a lot of parts that we looked at JP Morgan earlier this week, asset managers as well, uh, doing pretty well. And one of our screens yesterday had Schwab, one of those top names, uh, looking for a new 13-week high. So overall, really interesting um, signals from the financial sector. Looking down here very quickly at global ETFs, Brazil up the most. And again, when energy, when commodities are up, Probably a good guess that Brazil is going to be up as well. Also, Russia tied to uh, tied to commodities as well. Japan, we're going to look at a little later, but that was one of the top um, top uh, top ones uh, as well. India is one of the bottom ETFs. This is one of the few ETFs that's down when most things are up today. And again, when everything's up, it's worth noting what does not agree with that. What is actually a little bit of a divergence. India has actually been sort of a choppier market. There are a lot of ways. A lot of people look at, like to look at the Sensex or some other things. I look at the INDA because it's a U.S. traded ETF in U.S. dollars. So as a U.S. investor, it's probably the most common way you're going to access this market. This is down at the lows of this congestion range. So overall, not really that positive. Still above the moving average is still okay. But on a relative basis, nothing to get too excited about. So if you haven't looked at some of those global ETFs, I'm going to show you in a little bit um, how I use the, uh, the, the reporting system we've just added. But I think that's one thing uh, to certainly pay, uh, pay attention to. In our next segment, we've, we've looked at today's market. We've seen what's happened. Let's wrap the week. This is one of my favorite segments because we focus on the long term, right? So uh, I've often mentioned I keep pounding it away on, on the show. You know, don't get too caught up in the short term, too caught up in the flickering ticks. If you're thinking long term, if you're thinking about your retirement account or a long term investment strategy, you want to think about the short term price action, but within the context of the longer term trend. So uh, if you've not heard me talk about the first thing you look at in the morning, uh, look on YouTube, look for David Keller first thing in the morning, you're going to see a chart kind of like this. I think one of the most important things you can do is start your day with the right chart. If you look at something too short term, too intraday, too um, fluid, too noisy, you're going to get way too anxious with your investments and you want to start with a proper long term perspective. So this right here, folks, is the chart that I start with, which is a weekly chart of the S&P 500, and it's going back five years. So before I look at anything else, I remind myself, where are we at relative to the long-term trends? So until you get too excited about volatility, until you get too excited into the short-term themes from sectors and from ETFs and from small versus large cap and all the things we talk about, understand the long-term trend, which is undeniably positive, right? The chart is going up. The uh, S&P 500 is above two long-term weekly moving averages. I'm using the 21 and 34 week exponential moving averages here. The PPO, which is more of a tactical read using the weekly chart, is positive 
all signs in the green, and, and again, this is a trend-following device. It's not going to tell you, uh, you know, to be bearish until things really start to revert lower. But overall, let's just remember that the long-term trend has been positive. Next, let's look at a little bit of market breadth. So we've talked about this a number of different ways this week, but one of the charts I like to refer to is the S&P 500 daily chart here, and then the breadth line. So this is the cumulative advanced decline line for the S&P 500, for the mid cap index, and then for the small cap index. There's also the NYSE, which is a broader sort of large to mid cap uh, universe as well. So overall, all four of these are in the green. All four of these are positive. Um, the small cap uh, breadth line came down and tested support. That was one of the things we looked at earlier in the week, but overall has held up okay. So if there's one takeaway in terms of wrapping up this week, I would say this divergence, this continuing divergence with the large and the mid cap being the strongest, small cap not being as positive. I'm just looking at the slope of the advanced decline lines in the last month versus small cap, which is sort of sideways. You know, to feel really positive about uh, equities in general, you'd want to see the small cap breadth break to new highs like the large cap and mid cap ones have been doing. We haven't seen that yet. So it's sort of on the uh, on the radar of things to be paying attention to. But overall, none of these negative, all of them still in a positive mode. And that's totally fine. Next, we're going to look at new highs and new lows. So this is the S&P 500 at the top. The bottom panel I'll, I'll focus your attention to. This is the new highs and new lows every day for the S&P 500. So how many stocks are at a new 52-week high each day? How many stocks are at a new 52-week low today? We don't really have today's uh, bar on here yet. I would assume it's probably a little bit higher because of the fact that the market gapped higher with a lot of stocks uh, appearing to break out. So we'll see how this looks. But, you know, one of the themes that I've been looking at over the last couple weeks is this divergence between the market going higher and less and less stocks making new 52 week highs. Now, the reason why that's not a raging sell signal by any stretch of the imagination is we've seen this play before. And each time in the last th two times, at least, it's resolved higher. So we saw that in September. We saw that again in the end of October, where you had this divergence of higher highs in price, lower highs in, the, uh, in, the, in this breadth reading, but each time the market actually ended up resolving higher. So overall, again, it's sort of something to pay attention to, but it's not something that uh, is necessarily a climactically bad signal by any means, just the beginning of a divergence. I want to spend just a moment on this, and then we're going to continue on to, uh, to a scooter report here. But I wanted to look at breadth in the form of the percent of stocks above their 250-day moving averages. So as the S&P 500 testing all-time highs, how many, what percent of stocks are above their 200-day? Three out of every four companies in the S&P currently above their 200-day moving average, 75%. Overall, that is very, very healthy. The challenge is that lines up very well with short-term tactical uh, tops in the market going back for the last 12 months. So overall, we're at the point where the market has topped out before. But again, that is no guarantee that we will top out because if you look in 2017, this went well above the 75% level and remained high there. And that was in 2017 in a raging bull market, continuing pattern of, uh, of breakouts. What's interesting here, though, is the percent of stocks above the 50 day, which is diverging a lot more clearly because that's a much of a, you know, much more of a short term measure. So when things sell off very quickly, they'll go below the 50 day, but not necessarily through the 200 day moving average. You can see that's fluctuated, but has hovered around 65 to 70 percent. So you would certainly want to see that break higher, break above the previous levels. And that would sort of confirm a breakout in stocks. We have not quite seen that yet. That's something I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be looking at. I want to switch to the scooter reports. So we're going to go here to the scooter reports page. I'm going to look at large cap stocks. I'm going to look at one week. And sorry for the change of mind, but I'm going to switch to U.S. industry. So we talk often about um, the, uh, the industry changes and we look at what uh, industries have moved the most in the day. But at the end of the week, I like to take a step back and see what's fluctuated week to week. So if you remember, you change the scooter report to a one week look back. That's going to give you a weekly read on what's happened sort of a Friday to Friday period. So the top ranked industries, consumer uh, computer hardware, excuse me, healthcare providers, home construction. This is home builders, right? Fo footwear, specialty finance. So a number of different sectors that are actually represented here, a couple in industry, uh, in consumer super discretionary, but the number one is in technology, and that's a group that's done very, very well. New closing, new intraday highs this week after a nice rally. But let's look at what's fluctuated the most. So on the upside, surprise, it's actually mining stocks. So if gold stocks, gold miners are not on your radar, boy, take a look at that group again, because if gold continues to appreciate, if that group tends to do well, it is so off people's radar because it's just not been an area you think of when the market's going to new highs. But 
Gold miners up the most as an industry uh, relative to others. Then we get into some other, uh, water is actually a really interesting theme. That's a long-term thing I know a lot of individual investors are looking at, but the index itself actually one of the most improved. And then fixed, time, fixed line telecommunications. So what concerns me a little bit is when the market's testing new highs, some of these really conservative, what I think of as more risk off industries have actually improved the most. At the bottom of there, we have heavy construction that's in the industrial sector. Look at that breaking to new lows on the little preview chart. Broadline retailers, and again, if you have one general group that's struggled, retail in general has been a little tougher place, uh, but the uh, broadline retailers actually rolling over. You're going to see a number of other groups within industrials, things like aerospace, trucking. Those are things that reflect on transports, which is why Dow Theory has not been as attractive as other ways of slicing the market. So a number of interesting themes in here. Boy, when we wrap the week, I, I feel like I could spend an hour wrapping the week with you, but we need to move on, folks, to, uh, to continue the show. So we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be back with a really fantastic feature that uh, Grace and Rose and I uh, on, the, on the team here have been pushing to get released. It is out, and we're going to show it to you in, uh, in a minute. We'll be back in one minute, folks. Everyone, welcome back to this show, uh, The Final Bar. Thanks so much for joining us every day on the show. Really appreciate helping you understand visually what's happening in the markets. And then think about how to use stockcharts.com to understand the markets better and think about the long-term trends, trend following, momentum, all the things that, uh, that you're interested in. Um, what we're going to do next is do a new segment called Pro Tip. And what we talked about was uh, the good news is we start, have started releasing some really fantastic features on stockcharts.com, I want to make sure we get them in front of you. And so the, the uh, feature I want to share with you today is the chart list reports. We just released this in the last couple days, so you should see it on the, on the top. And, and as with most things, if you've not used it yet, you're going to see a pop-up, a little header at the top of your uh, login, uh, at the top of some of your charts, and just click on that. It'll show you uh, how to engage it. But I'm going to bring up one of my chart lists. I'm going to go to the summary page. So on your member dashboard, bring up the summary, and you're going to find some new features here at the top. On any of your chart lists, you can now opt to send a daily report or send a weekly report. What this is going to do, so if I click on daily report, it's going to ask me when I want to uh, time this report. And we just default to the closing bell uh, for some of these major markets that our, our customers are following. I'm going to say U.S. market close. When I click save, what that's going to do is at the end of every uh, close in the U.S. time, so 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 o'clock Pacific, I'm going to get an email with a performance view of how this group of securities, whatever's on my chart list, has done day to day. I could also do a weekly report, which is going to send it at the end of every week based on the market that I select, and it's going to give me a weekly return. Uh, so one week to one week, what's happened in these markets. I want to show you very quickly what these actually look like, and you're going to get a sense of them. So these are actually the chart lists that I've been testing. This is over my own login, so yours might be look a little different. But I had two things that I thought would be really helpful. We've tested this on portfolios. Really fantastic. Two ways that I found it interesting. One is looking at the Dow industry. So just now we were looking at the Dow industries based on the scooter rankings. Look at what's moved. But now every day at around 4, 4.15, 4.30 p.m., depending on, on, uh, on how things are set up, I'm going to get an email with the Dow industries. And it's in order from the best performance performer down to the worst performer. And this is just a list based on the chart list that I created. So every day I can see what's working and what isn't working today. I can think about how to connect that to the long-term uh, trends. Second one I'll show you was using uh, ETFs. So this is one of the chart lists I refer to as a candle glance every day. This is the way that I understand visually what's happening uh, across the global market. So I have the U.S. market, I have EFA, EM, and frontier markets, and then I have a bunch of uh, country ETFs that I like to follow. Every day I now get an email from Stock Charts telling me what's happened today. And this is uh, yesterday, so it's a little out of date, but I just wanted to make sure I showed you a good example. So yesterday when I got the email, I knew that China, Brazil, the China air shares, Taiwan ETFs were up the most. At the bottom, I had some European indexes, really developed uh, markets. Japan was the, the third from the bottom. So what we can do with this feature is get an automated email to yourself 
understanding what's happened. So you could do this on a portfolio, on a watch list, on a list of ETFs, a list of industries, and it's going to show you a daily or weekly report of what's happened. So it's a fantastic feature. The way that you do this, again, is if you go to your member dashboard, go to the chart list feature. So on the upper right, you're going to have an option to go to your chart list. That's the easiest way to get down to it. Pick one that you want to do and then say... Uh, summary view, that's going to give you a summary of what securities have on there. Click on send daily report or send weekly report. It'll use the login email that you created your login with and it's going to start automating those. I'd encourage you to set those up with a couple of the chart lists that you like to follow. Send your feedback to us through the, uh, through the stock charts uh, help desk. We'll, we're going to monitor all of that and I think you're going to find it's a great way to help you understand what charts you should be looking at. A lot of times I get people asking questions about a particular chart, and I often want to talk to them about, remember, is that the right chart to be looking at in the first place? That's what these daily and weekly reports are going to allow you to do. So that is our pro tip uh, for the week. Thanks so much for, uh, for checking that out on the, uh, on the member dashboard page. We are now going to open up the stock charts, the uh, final bar mailbag. Thank you so, so much for sending all of your questions our way. And again, a couple of ways you can do it. Uh, number one is with uh, email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. You can also get to us on Twitter at final bar SCTV or anytime during the show. Just put in a question in the chat room and we'll get to it uh, on a future show whenever we can. One of the questions, I'm just going to answer two questions that have, uh, that have come through. Number was, uh, I, I mentioned higher highs and higher lows, lower lows and lower highs. We talked about this earlier in the week, and my wife, again, loves to uh, tell me how often I say that on the show. And my response to her is good, because I want people to get that. As, if there's one thing you take away from the way that I think of charts, think about that. Start simplistically is the chart going up or down? Because until you answer that question, you've not earned the right to answer subsequent questions uh, using other more sophisticated techniques. But the question was, what are you using? So earlier, you know, I mentioned, I, are you using intraday or closing prices, highs and lows or closing prices? We talked about that earlier, and usually I'm using intraday highs and lows. But this was when I, when I look at a chart and I say we see a pattern of higher highs and higher lows, what am I actually talking about? What levels am I talking about? Now, a great way to visualize that, we actually have an indicator called zigzag. And if you've not seen it below the sharp chart, if you go to the overlay section, there's an indicator called zigzag. And if you put that on there, it's going to look kind of like this. This is a chart of Home Depot, and I've engaged the zigzag indicator. What this does is it looks at the highs and the lows. So, you know, the trend overall on Home Depot has been up. But you can see that it doesn't just go straight from one point to the other. There are a bunch of sort of zigzags, right? A period of impulse waves and corrective waves. When we move up, we correct a little bit. But overall, the trend is higher, but there are little subsequent shorter uptrends and downtrends. What this zigzag indicator does is it automated, in an automated fashion, it focuses in on these percent moves and it draws lines to indicate highs and lows. And when I talk about higher highs and higher lows, I'm essentially visually doing this zigzag indicator in my head. And I'm looking when the price has an impulse move higher and then a pullback and another impulse move higher. Is that next leg higher than the previous leg? So you will hear the language I use a lot of time talking about this leg versus the previous leg or has it broken to a new swing high or a new swing low? And what I'm talking about is when the market moves higher, does that next high, that next peak in price go higher than the previous peak in price, the previous high. Now, this right now looks a little noisy to me because it's automated. It's basically looking at a bunch of charts and it's giving you an average percent return, but you can put in a number. So if I put in five, that's gonna say 5%. Once the stock moves 5% up or down, you can add a new zigzag line. And now this looks maybe more visually how I think of a chart like Home Depot. The stock has moved up from the market bottom on uh, Christmas Eve of last year. It's moved higher and I can see this pattern of higher highs and higher lows. And every impulse wave moves higher. Every corrective wave does not go lower than the previous leg. And you can see visually how that zig zigzag moves higher. But what's happened more recently, we've now gone below the most recent swing low, right? We've gone to a lower low. So when I talk about higher highs, I'm looking at these peaks. When I'm talking about higher lows, I'm looking at the, the bottoms, the, the valleys in the price. And when I'm talking about lower lows, I'm indicating this pattern where it goes below the previous low. If you're not familiar with that zigzag indicator, go to the chart school page. We have an article on the zigzag explain how it's calculated. It is super simple, but it's a great way to visually, if you're not comfortable with when I say higher highs and higher lows, you may want to add that to some of your charts 
because it'll just visually help you guide into are we seeing higher highs or lows, just giving you a very simple way to do it. Once you've done this long enough for me, I tend to not show that on the chart because visually I can sort of see the zigzags in my head because I've, I've looked at enough of these charts that I can see these patterns and I can simplify the noise and just understand these legs that have gone higher and now started to go lower. So it's a great way to just say overall is Home Depot in an uptrend or downtrend? I would have to say by simple definition, it's in a downtrend because the most recent break was a new lower low because this low is below the previous swing low. Again, if you're not familiar with that, I would encourage you um, to engage that zigzag indicator. The next question, I wanted to spend a little time on that. Uh, I've got some great questions about artificial intelligence, and I'm going to tell you this is a brief touch on that, and we're going to have uh, further discussions, maybe with some experts that'll help us get some color on it. Um, you know, the question was, how is artificial intelligence affecting all the things we talk about this show? Uh, some of the experts were talking about, how does this affect technical analysis? I will, I will tell you this, there are levels of automation, ways you can automate what you're doing. The first level of automation, besides just looking at hundreds of thousands of charts on your very own, is to use screening tools, right? That is the first level, basically telling the computer, here's what I think is important, you tell me when you find something that fits my criteria. The next upgrade to that automation is to engage a trading system. Say, this is a screen that I really, really like. Computer, I now want you to automate this and start running this on your own. Tell me when the signals are, are doing it. Let me see how that performs over time. The next upgrade is what I would call quantitative investing, which is saying, here are a bunch of different factors that I might engage, potential trading systems. Let me start to put this on a portfolio level and start to understand this more broadly. And then the final level is what you'd asked about uh, over the question, which was artificial intelligence. That is basically, uh, the way I would think of it is a quantitative model or trading system. This is basically uh, having a recipe and giving the computer the recipe and saying, cook this over time and over time, if there are ways I can maybe tweak the ingredients and see if that gives me better results. This last one, artificial intelligence, instead of giving the computer a recipe, you are giving the computer a bunch of ingredients and the computer is developing its own recipe and creating its own uh, feedback loop to continue to improve that uh, recipe. And, and it'll start to surprise you with what it finds. So that is what artificial intelligence means to me. What does technical analysis relate to this? I think it is an incredibly important input, which is why every step of these uh, levels from any institutions I've worked with have included technical analysis in the form of price and momentum and sentiment. So there are a lot of things that we could do with that. Artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning is a theme we are going to get to that is something that's going to be, I think, pivotal uh, for, uh, for charts and for, uh, for analysis of the financial markets, your portfolio. So we're going to make a point of revisiting that as much as possible. But today, folks, we have to get to the uh, end of the show in the form of the three and three, three charts and three minutes. You should be looking at these charts if you've not looked at them yet. Number one is EFA. We showed on my chart list report sort of global markets, global ETFs, and how they're moving relative to one another. The S&P 500 approaching all-time highs once again. But this market, EFA, which is global developed markets, things like developed Europe, uh, developed Asia, things like Japan and so forth, um, is reflected in EFA. This actually is already testing new highs. So 69, 68, 50 to 69 has been a key resistance level. It has tested it today, testing a new price and closing high today. So next week, does that continue? That'll be the question for us. Number two, um, small cap charts, uh, small cap uh, indexes. So this is the Russell 2000. Are we able to eclipse uh, the previous levels that we had? We've looked at this before. And the real question is, are we able to break to new highs? We had a new price, a new closing high today. I think that's going to be pivotal. Do we continue that going into uh, year end? And my third one is actually a chart of Japan. So while uh, IFA has performed very well, new closing, new price highs, uh, small caps actually testing resistance, testing new highs, is it able to break higher? Japan has already gone to new highs. And we have the U.S. markets at that level. Is it going to be able to push through to year end? It's worth noting that some markets actually already have gone to new highs. And Japan is a, is a chart that a number of my, uh, my peers in the industry have uh, been talking to them about new price highs, new relative highs. Think about that zigzag indicator we've looked at. It's on, a, it's on a new zag higher, a new zig higher, right? It's continued to see higher highs, higher lows. Uh, very, uh, very promising. It's a chart I'll be looking at uh, going into uh, to year end. Folks, that is our show for today and our, our ability to wrap the week uh, using the final bar. I want to remind you, as always, keep your questions and your feedback coming. The final bar 
at stockcharts.com. Uh, you can also get to us on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. We're going to be off on Monday because we're traveling to New York. Next week, we're going to be uh, doing the show live a couple days from New York City, including the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. For stockcharts.com, I'm Dave Keller. Have a good night.